uh, encourage you to read that insert. Uh, Keith mentioned the article that's on the front, How to Walk and When to Stand, in light of what's going on in our uh, current political scenario. But on the back is a very important article, A Christian Non-Negotiable Belief, uh, from the Berean, uh, a paper that comes out of Oregon and Washington. Uh, very important because there is a movement in missions to Islam today to deny some of the key doctrines of Christology, that is, the person and work of Christ, denying the Trinity, uh, putting Mohammed on the same level as the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I encourage you very strongly, please read that article on the back of that insert by Steve Montgomery. I think you'll find it very, very interesting, and you will probably perceive in it some of what's going on in many evangelical missions today. Uh, so please do pick that up, take it home, uh, read it, not during the sermon, uh, but read it after you get home, okay? <laughs> and thank you all very much for praying for Nehemiah. Uh, he actually self-diagnosed himself, as you know, he's a medical doctor. And uh, when he had gotten to the airport, uh, he had picked up a hoagie sandwich, uh, they were flying out there to spend their vacation. He's the low man on the totem pole in his ophthalmology practice. And as a result, uh, he doesn't get to cri take Christmas vacations. So this was his, um, uh, this was his vacation. So uh, they, he ate that and then got violently ill. And as a result, as you know, it uh, ruptured his esophagus. So now, thank you for praying for him. I know many of you are on that prayer chain. And uh, many people around the world, actually, uh, many friends overseas were praying for Nehemiah during that period of time. Now please take your Bibles and turn back there to Exodus chapter 12. Oh, and let me mention one other thing too. I hope you can be here on Valentine's Day. Sunday this year, can you believe it? Valentine's Day is on Sunday this year. And um, so in the morning, uh, I'm going to be breaking out of the study of the book of Exodus, which at this point is all about um, blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrhine, boils, hail, locust, darkness, and death. I hope you've got that memorized. I've given you a budak. I'm going to give you a test one of these days, a piece of paper in your bulletin where you'll have to write it down. I've been over this enough times. <laughs> I hope you have it. But on that Sunday, we're going to break into it, and I'm going to preach in the morning on how should a man love a woman and how should a woman love a man about biblical principles of love. And I hope that you will be here for that. It's very important. It doesn't matter whether you're single or married or widowed. Uh, it is a very important topic because it helps you understand how God designed us and how we are supposed to love reflecting the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, I think you will find it interesting no matter how young or how old you are so be there in the morning and then in the evening I've actually paid for a license to show a film called Marriage Retreat and because uh, that's uh, Valentine's Day and uh, please invite your friends I hope to actually get some advertisement in the newspapers for it. We'd love to see a lot of folks come. It's, uh, it covers a lot of issues that are difficult issues in marriages today. Uh, so that film will be on Valentine's Day for the evening service, a special uh, for that day. Now please take your Bibles and turn back over to Exodus chapter 12, 21 through 28. This is Pass It On, or Child Training, part number two that we're talking about today. You probably picked that up in the text that I read a few minutes ago in Exodus chapter 12 about the children asking their parents, what do you mean by this service? What are the parents supposed to tell them? What are they supposed to teach? How is it supposed to communicate between one generation and the next generation? You remember that in the immediate preceding context here in Exodus chapter 12, we've seen how Paul, quoting various things from that context, cites the Passover and the Exodus narratives and how he tied eight key doctrines together in Romans chapter 11. And we have gone over Romans chapter 11 and gone through each of those eight key doctrines and picked them up out of the text as we've gone through. Eight doctrines that stem from Christ fulfilling the typology as the Passover lamb. Obviously, within this context, those should be things that we should be passing on to our children. Things that we should be passing on to our grandchildren. When our children say, what do you mean by this? Why are you living the way you're living? Why are you going through this particular service at the church or what? These are certainly at least eight key doctrines because those are the ones that Paul cites out of the Exodus narrative that we should be teaching and passing on to our children. Number one, the remnant principle. Number two, judgmental blindness. Number three, chastening and loss of rewards. Number four, eternal security. 
Number five, restoration for blessing after repentance. Guaranteed future in the land of promise for national Israel. That was number six. Number seven, the permanent nature of the covenants of God. Number eight, spiritual gifts and the grace of God. Paul cites the Exodus narrative in relation to all eight of those principles. And I hope you've been taking notes because that's the only way you'll have gotten it. I covered them briefly, one after another, and spent some time on each one so you could have written them down if you'd had a blank piece of paper and a pencil. I encourage you to take notes. We also have seen that God uses Satan as his instrument of judgmental blindness as we're going through the text here, very clearly expressed in that plague of darkness. But he uses judgmental blindness not only on wicked pagans, but he also uses it, and we saw many passages in the New Testament that teach this, he uses Satan as an instrument of judgment against believers who insist on continuing in sin. He said, I've turned such one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, talking about a man living in incest. He talks about those who had been teaching false doctrine. They hadn't denied the resurrection of Christ, but they said the resurrection is past and overthrow the faith is some. That was Hymenaeus and Philetus. And he says, I've turned them over to, to Satan. Dear people, he's a very cruel instrument of judgment. And if God removes his restraining hand, and if he turns you over to Satan, you're in serious trouble doesn't mean you'll lose your salvation. We've got eternal security. We talked about that. But it can certainly be a miserable situation that you have to go through and even unto death. That was in this context. That's clearly one of the doctrines that we need to teach to our children. It's one of the great truths that will act as a restraint on the flesh and the inborn spirit of rebellion that every one of our children and grandchildren have. And believe me, I've got 13 children and I have somewhere between 25 and 30 grandchildren. I can never really tell. I did find out at Christmas that one more of my daughters-in-law is expecting. Dear people, you cannot restrain the flesh with the flesh. You can only restrain the flesh with the Spirit of God and with the warnings of the Word of God. We need to teach that to our children. That was clearly stated in Romans 11, 19 through 21, a passage that we looked at in detail will not cover it again. Number two, we saw many passages that teach us that chastening is actually a manifestation of grace. Remember that. When you're going through a spanking from God, remember that chastening is a manifestation of grace. You know, that's a, a thing that's hard for us to understand. But you know, when we discipline our children, and we're required by God to discipline our children, all you young people sitting here in the front row, <laughs> Uh, those young people sitting in the back row, when we discipline our children and we're required to discipline our children, we need to teach them the theology of grace. Don't just do it. It's an instructive instrument to teach them about the grace of God. Because there's a kind and wonderful and glorious side to chastening. The Bible tells us and we saw multiple passages in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We saw multiple passages that tell us that chastening proves love. Whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The child that the father loves will be the recipient of chastening in the physical realm as well as in the spiritual realm. Earthly fathers are supposed to reflect their heavenly father in applying the rod to their children. We're supposed to be passing things on, folks. Do you just do it rootly, quack, 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 and send the kid off, or go stand in the corner and walk away? Or do you teach them that this is an instrument of grace to restrain them from doing that which will ultimately hurt them worse? Have you taught your children the principle, if you fail to pass them on, when they come under judgmental blindness, one of the main doctrines in our passage, they will not understand that the underlying grace of God is there to bring them through the discipline. We also saw how a true believer, even a hero of faith, and we, we see that happening with Moses. I mean, he was a true believer and a hero of faith, and yet he got a couple of spankings, real hard spankings from God. But we saw that even other heroes of faith can reach a point of no return. We looked at the life of the sex-saturated Samson. 
He thought that he was getting away with his repeat sins until suddenly it was too late. There comes a life, even or a time, even in the life of a believer, when he reaches, or when she reaches, a point of no return. When you're recalcitrant, I love that word. <laughs> when you're stubbornly rebellious and refuse to submit to authority, God puts up with it just for so long. The scripture tells us that Israel rebelled against God ten times in the wilderness. God put up with it ten times, and then God said, from that point on, everybody age 20 and over is going to die in the wilderness. And the kids that you thought the giants of the land were going to eat up, they're going to be the ones that go in and take the land. Ten times. What number are you on? There comes a point of no return. Samson had to learn that. And it's very, very serious issue. Have you taught your children the principle of the point of no return? Have you taught your children the five consequences of immorality? Have you taught them the consequences for refusal to walk in the Spirit instead of walking in the flesh? Remember, Samson, I gave you five. His refusal to live in the power of the Spirit of God and in obedience to the Word of God cost him five things. It cost him his freedom. Your sin will cost you your freedom. Number two, it cost him his honor. Number three, it cost him his sight. Number four, it cost him his authority as a judge in Israel. Number five, it ultimately cost him his life. God judges carnal believers severely, even those who are heroes of faith. Samson is listed in Hebrews 11 as one of the heroes of faith. And you wonder, how did God measure Samson's faith? It must have been in nanoseconds. <laughs> God says he was a hero of faith. But he also ended up dead and blind as a result of his own sin. God judges even heroes of faith who are carnal. Have you clearly taught this lesson to your children? Have you taught it to your grandchildren? Remember, we're talking about the things that God requires when he tells you to pass it on. These are just a few of the lessons that we've drawn from our study of the ten plagues in Egypt. Now, in our text for today, Moses is bringing it up again in summary form. In our text, Moses is saying to them, Remember the setting for the first Passover. It was the darkness of judgmental blindness, a blindness followed by death because they'd indulged in what I've called the seven deadly sins. I hope you were here for the evening services when I covered the seven deadly sins. That's what they've been called, anyway. Big categories. We studied those in detail at the evening service, so I'll only summarize them here. Have you hardened your heart to the one who declared that he himself is the light of the world by walking in the flesh, lusting after the leeks and lentils of Egypt, which is out of our text? Is your gluttonous belly your god? Is your mind saturated with sex? Lust. Are you lazy, indolent, sluggard, and slothful? Is your heart filled with envy? Are you a greedy, covetous worm chained to the temporal garbage of earth? The worms love the garbage. Are you angry and bitter, jealous and petty, manipulative and focused on trivia? Are you so proud that you refuse to admit your own sin? Now, the elders graciously brought to my attention this past week that uh, we've had some recent complaints that my teaching is not clear enough. I hope that was clear, what I just said. Uh, maybe you didn't like it. Maybe that's a real complaint. But the elders said to me, you know, your teaching is not clear enough. What are we going to do about it? Well, of course, I'm the only one that can do anything about it, not we. So let me ask you a question. And I don't know exactly who everybody is, but um, let me ask you a question. Every week I do a review and a summary of the week before. I just did that for you a minute ago. I do this at both the morning and evening service. I give you lists of principles and I number them. I periodically summarize the list like I've just done. I've done this repeatedly through the ten plagues. Did you ever bother to write them down? I am not speaking 
Swahili. I did this repeatedly when I went through the seven deadly sins. Can you list the seven deadly sins? If not, why not? Is the problem a lack of clarity in the pulpit or of sloth in the pew? I encourage you to take notes on a blank sheet of paper if you need to remember things. Now last week in particular we dealt with three foundational areas of passing it on. Passing it on to our children, passing it on to our grandchildren, and in some cases here passing it on to great-grandchildren. Three categories. If you didn't get the categories, here they are again. Teaching, that's communication, number one. Category number two, discipline. Those are easy words. Category number three, example. How are you living your life? That's like a three-legged stool. If you remove any one of those lessons, you will not successfully train your children or grandchildren in the fear of the Lord. Let me read it out of our text again. Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the little and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. He didn't say... You know, sweep across the lintel of your doorpost and dribble it in a straight line into your house. That wasn't what God told him to say, was it? He didn't say, uh, you know, go outside your house and paint around the windows so they can't, the, the stir can't get in the windows. Moses told them exactly what God told him. And none of you should go out of the house until the morning. Well, but you know, I, I, I hear something out there in the yard. Can't I go out and take a peek? Well, after all, I'd sure like to see what's happening tonight because it's been so dark. and I would love to see the angel of death passing over and killing all those Egyptians. Don't go out the door. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. That was God's purpose. But you know what? Disobedient Israelites, if there were any, would get hit too. Just remember that. God's purpose is to judge the world. You don't want to be there when he does it. The Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. There was a place of safety. There was a place of refuge. And if you can picture a door, and there's a door right there. It's on the two sides. It's on the top, and that blood on the top begins to drip, and it forms a cross. Dear people, and that's the blood of the Passover lamb. Paul tells us Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. That's a picture of the cross. John 1, 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Are you in the household of salvation? Is the blood over the door of your heart? Are you protected by the cross? And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. It's intergenerational. This is something to pass on to your children. We're talking about child training. And Moses is telling them something here as he summarizes what God has told him about that final plague of death. He's summarizing something that must be passed on from generation to generation to generation. You are Christians. You have the blood of the Passover lamb. Are you passing it on? Are you really passing it on in all three ways? By what you teach your children. By the way in which you discipline your children. Remember, discipline proves love. 
It's an act of grace to keep them from worse danger. Oh, but the last one, that's the hard one. Are you telling them, do what I say, not what I do? You tell them, don't take drugs, but you smoke. You tell them, don't run around and do immoral things, but you have girly magazines. You tell them, you must obey me. Your mom, you say to those kids, you better obey me, I'm your mother. And then you rebel against your husbands. You teach a lot more by what you do than by what you say. He's going to point that out here in our text. You're to teach it to your sons forever, and it shall come to pass when you become into the land which the Lord will give you. Dear people, I'm wearing a pin this morning with the flag of Israel on it. God gave the land to Israel. Through Jacob, not Esau. Through Isaac, not Hagar and her son. God says, I'm giving it to you forever. The land which I will give to you. Who owns the land? God owns the land. Who has the right to give it or withhold it? God has the right to give it or withhold it. The land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised. You're going to see God do it. And you are going to keep this service. How long? Oh, the first year after you get into the land. That'll help you remember it once you're in the land. No. You and your sons are going to do it forever. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you. It's something that will, in fact, happen. Your children are going to say something to you. You're going to go into the land. You're going to, every year, you're going to remember the feast of Pesach, of Passover. And you're going to go through certain steps. And we discussed Passover in detail. And I brought in the beautiful little Passover plate and showed you all the different things that are in each one of the little cups in the plate. We talked about each one. We talked about how the parents, the father or the grandfather, as if the head of the table will teach certain th things and certain lessons and the children will ask certain questions as they go through the Passover meal and the different four cups of Passover and the youngest boy going out to the door and opening it to see if Elijah is there. And why do they do those things? They are teaching their children and they are doing it. So they will never forget. <laughs> when you celebrate Christmas, do you spend most of your time talking about Santa Claus and presents? Or do you spend time reading the Christmas narrative out of Luke chapter 2, for example, and discussing the miracle of the incarnation of God the Son? Do you spend your time feasting and all the good stuff and forgetting who it was that gave it to you? At Easter, a word which comes from Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of fertility, at Resurrection Sunday. Do you spend your time thinking about bunny rabbits and Easter eggs and frilly dresses? Or do you come at our early morning Resurrection Sunrise service to hear the glory of the resurrection of the living Christ who has conquered death Have you focused on Jesus? What are you teaching, disciplining, exampling for your children? Sloth or diligence? Lust or moral purity? Anger, hatred, and bitterness? Or tenderness, love, and kindness? 
excuse making or diligent service. Your children are watching. That's what Moses is telling them. That's what God told Moses to tell them. And that's why they do what they do. And why the Jews, no matter where they have been, all through the centuries are still there and an identifiable people. All the other mighty empires have fallen. I mean, you know, some of the people who are descendants of the Romans and some were the descendants of the Persians and some were the descendants of the Medes and some were descendants of Babylonians. Great mighty empires of the past in the Bible. But only one people as a people unit remains the most unlikely of all because they have passed it on to their children. Oh, people, I love you. I've tried hard to pass it on to my kids and grandkids, and I think most of them have got it. How about yours? I often hear that this church is well grounded doctrinally, and they're sound and they've got a lot of Bible knowledge. Okay. How has it changed your life? How has it changed? your life. I love you. I tell you this because I love you. <sighs> what mean you by this service that ye shall say? It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. Not just the sacrifice of the Passover, the angel of death. It's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. It belongs to God. This is his feast. He's the one who established it. He's the one who gave it as a teaching example of who he is, what he can do, when he will do it, and why he will do it. It's to teach us something. Your children will say this unto you. You know, God guarantees that your kids are going to ask you questions. Now, those of you who are parents know that the kids ask questions. Those of you who are parents of more than one child know that more than one child asks the same question, and you keep having to repeat it one after another. I did that with 13 kids, and some of them didn't get it the first time. They asked me the same question over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and some of them are still asking some of the questions that I answered when they were little teeny kids. I'm still teaching them. When they say unto you, what do you mean by this? I'm still teaching them. I'm still trying to live it in front of them so that they'll have a visible role model as to what this means. Do you? What mean ye by this service that you shall say it is the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses? Now I want you to look at the last two things. One phrase in verse 27 and verse 28. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. True doctrine, correctly applied, always results in worship. Let me say it again. True doctrine, correctly applied, always results in worship. As I had my prayer time this morning, right before the service with Brother Keith, here out in the hall, we do that every week before the service. It just struck me how much we miss the point of why do we go to church. Some people go to church because they have fellowship, and that's true. It's a good reason. There's fellowship with other believers. Some people go to church to ease their conscience because they weren't so good this past week, and they think that maybe this will get them some points with God. Some people go to church because, after all, they love to sing. And I'm delighted that you folks here love to sing. Wish we had more. Wish we had a grand and glorious choir here. 
And I certainly appreciate you ladies who participate in the choir. I love music. And, and our pianists, too. Thank you. Some people go to church because they say, well, I want to satisfy me. I want something out of it. So I can go home and keep on feeling good about myself because I didn't hear anything negative. Power of positive thinking, Norman Vincent Peale. Other people don't know why they're there. They just show up because they always did it. It's habit. You know the main purpose for the church getting together? There are three things. There is prayer. Corporate prayer is powerful. Number two, there's teaching of the Word of God. That's your spiritual food. You should be having a regular intake on a daily basis, but Scripture commands, commands corporate worship. We talked about that in the book of Hebrews. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhort one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And that's in the context of judgment. If you don't do it, you will be spanked by your heavenly Father. There is the teaching of the Word. But do you know the primary purpose for gathering here? And why believers gather all over the world, some of them in very dangerous situations, at the risk of their lives. It's to worship God. The God of Scripture. There are many pagans worshiping false gods. But believers gather to worship. True doctrine correctly applied always results in worship. If you hear true doctrine from this pulpit and you don't apply it, it will not result in worship in your life. Or when you're here, you'll be thinking about other things. Worship is when you focus on God. Worship is when you are here to say, I love you, Father. I adore you. No matter what happens in my life, I am yours and I love you. Teach me to love you more. I tell you, that's something that God has been working in my life ever since Judy died. Many times I wake up crying at night and I worship. I worship. I praise Him. I thank Him for who He is and what He's done. And I confess to Him I don't understand it. But I love Him. I love Him more intensely now than I did when she was alive. He's using it to teach me to love him more. Oh, dear people, I hope you don't have to go through that to learn to love and worship the God who loves you so much that he gave his son to die for you. That's the principal reason that we're here is to worship not to be entertained not just to get something for ourselves but to worship what did the people do after Moses explained what was going to happen and how it was to be passed on and how their children would ask them about that it says and the people bowed the head and worshipped. Notice something else. They did that first before verse 28. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. It's not enough to be here on Sunday and say, well, I've, I've fulfilled my obligation. I have worshipped God, and, you know, you put that in quotes. 
I've worshipped God. But they had heard what God had to say, and today you've heard what God has to say. I hope it has drawn you to worship. But then the people are going to go away. This congregation is going to break up in about two minutes. We're almost done. Will you do what it says in verse 28? The children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded. So did they. Not so thought they, not so talked they about it, not so, well, we thought about it and we hope that maybe someday it will happen in our lives, but hope not right now. They had very little time, folks. It was going to be that night. The clock was ticking. Death was coming. Did you know death is coming for you? You don't know when. You don't know how. You don't know why. Death is coming for you. When they heard, they worshipped, and then they did. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Keep us from being a people who are hearers of the word only and not doers of the word. Cause us to be a people who love you. A people who listen carefully, who obey precisely. Moses communicated precise instructions. The children of Israel did and obeyed the precise instructions. They didn't change it a little bit. They didn't decide to make it culturally acceptable. They didn't try to contextualize it. They didn't try to make it fit their categories. They had learned how important it was to obey exactly when God speaks. Moses has had to learn that lesson. Moses had been with his life on the line on several occasions where God got angry with him. Moses knew that God wasn't fooling around and the children of Israel had just seen ten judgments by God or nine at this point and they knew that God wasn't fooling around. They learned that you obey God when he tells you to do something and you do it his way, not your way. God had given a very simple command to Pharaoh. Let my people go. Pharaoh refused. Pharaoh tried to work compromises and cut deals with God. And every time God hit him with a plague. Israel had learned that when God speaks, you had better obey. Father, give us tender hearts. Give us tender hearts. Give us eyes that see in the light, not judgmental blindness. Make us into a people who hear your word, who worship you, and who obey. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing